Doctor Who. The feeling uh, amongst the production creative uh, staff was that um, the Victorian Edwardian feel uh, is sort of a wonderful feel for Doctor Who, that the, uh, uh, the idea of time travel juxtaposed against this sort of glorious empire was uh, one that we sort of really hooked into because uh, uh, I think it's very difficult to, to show the future um, and to come up with something that is stylistically so unusual and so wonderful that every button you look at doesn't look like it was gotten from the local hardware store anyway. So uh, we thought that by going to a sort of turn of the century kind of feel, um, it, it took a lot of the burden off of uh, having to show uh, what, uh, what their future was like. We thought that their future actually kissed our past and that's what we sort of liked about that. I got to play with that thing. You did? Yeah. Oh, that's right, I remember that. Um, this is uh, one of the, uh, the guys who uh, really did a, a lot for us. This is Pete Ware. Pete Ware was my uh, line producer, and he was responsible for making sure that uh, people like Yiji got to where he was supposed to be every morning, which was not easy. Um, and it cart those trucks and all those cameras around Vancouver for 30 days. Um, and uh, really, really a talented man. Couldn't have done it without him. Uh, this is uh, our director and director of cinematography. To your left is Jeffrey Sachs, the director. And to your right is Glenn McPherson, the director of photography, who uh, I thought did an outstanding job. And there uh, were a lot of fun, a lot of fun to be around, it made the set uh, uh, quite a, a fun place to be. From an actor's perspective, Jeffrey Sachs was, well from every perspective, Jeffrey Sachs was the best, bar none, the best director I'd ever worked with. He's, um, he's a very nice man, very humorous man, he taught me a lot of things. A1. This is uh, Tony Down, who uh, some of you may remember from Leave it to Beaver. Tony is uh, also a uh, very talented director, a uh, situation comedy director mostly. Um, uh, some of you may have seen his work on Coach. Uh, he does a lot of half hour comedy. Uh, he's also an incredibly talented visual effects supervisor. And um, he also did a picture for Universal called uh, Captain Zoom. I don't know if any of you saw that. But uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. He, um, he just uh, is incredibly talented. He, he designed the main title sequence. Um, we didn't actually get a chance to, to do everything he wanted to do in the main title. Uh, but uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was a lot of fun to work with. We played a joke, which we, uh, we, we didn't get a chance to do it. But behind him is a set of cabinets. And it, they're false cabinets. Only one of the cabinets opens. And uh, it's out of one of those cabinets that Eric Roberts pulls out the gold dust that he gives to Yiji. Um, the gold dust was obviously in, in a reference to uh, protecting the doctor, protecting himself against Cybermen. Um, that's why we did the gold dust. But also in the drawer, which, which never came out, was uh, an old toilet plunger that somebody had sprayed silver and put wires on the end to look like a garlic plunger. But, uh, and it actually, if you look very carefully in the movie, uh, the, the toilet plunger is actually on the set. Uh, here is the famous box. Uh, uh, we uh, obviously uh, built it to scale uh, using the, uh, the original plans that the BBC supplied to us. Uh, it was built out of pine and oak. Um, and uh, there are 11 layers of paint. Uh, the, uh, the box was uh, constructed in pieces. It weighed a ton. Um, and uh, I thought they did an excellent job the first time I saw it. I, uh, I was really moved. They did a nice job. Here's Paul. This was uh, taken the first day of uh, production uh, in his lovely wig. Um, I don't know if, how many of you heard my story the other day. He showed up uh, 
two days before we were ready to shoot, uh, bald. Uh, he'd just come back from South Africa, we'd been shooting a military movie, and so he had no hair. So in five days, uh, some very talented artisans, uh, with the help of a woman who was trained in London, hand sewed human hair onto a very fine micro mesh scalp, skull cap, which uh, uh, is on his head, and I think they did a terrific job. There's a close-up of uh, old dreamy eyes. There he is again. I love those eyes. Here he is with Daphne. <laughs> Daphne was quite wonderful because Daphne didn't know the first thing about Doctor Who. Uh, you know, she, she thought she was actually doing a medical thriller. And uh, she showed up for the uh, audition and she came in and uh, uh, Everybody else was sort of, uh, you know, studying the tapes of Doctor Who and, and sort of trying to figure out what the character was. And, uh, you know, Daphne was the one who came in and said, look, I'm terribly sorry, but I thought this was a medical thriller. I don't know what I'm doing here. I mean, I really, you know, I mean, I really, if you want me to read, I'll read, but I really shouldn't be here. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know the first thing about this thing. And it was that attitude that we loved so much uh, that uh, got her the job in the room. Uh, her brother is uh, Dana Ashbrook who some of you may remember is Bobby from Twin Peaks. Here they are, uh, obviously, uh, clowning around. This was uh, everything that was shot for this scene. This was the first day of production. So uh, everything, uh, the Who Am I um, uh, stuff uh, in her apartment uh, was done on the first day. Um, and it's interesting to, to know that uh, we were quite fortunate that obviously uh, they were sort of just getting into their characters on this day and, and it was actually the first day they kind of really met each other so it sort of all worked out quite nicely. Here's uh, Yeech and Eric who ended up looking a little bit like Terminator, didn't he? <laughs> um, I'll tell you why all that happened. Um, we had uh, a wonderful makeup artist uh, for Eric to use. The idea was that uh, we were going to give Eric, uh, uh, we were going to make a face mask of Eric, and we were going to make him look like the master from the original series, and uh, uh, but with the side of his face peeling away. Uh, so it was a sort of a, uh, an Ainley kind of uh, Delgado-looking master with with sort of flesh falling off of his face slowly. And uh, this was the one area where uh, Eric uh, drove us into a brick wall. He refused to have his face made into a mask. He didn't want to be covered and, you know, go through that process. He didn't want his hair touched. So we couldn't do that. Um, and uh, he didn't want any uh, latex appliances on his face. Uh, so literally hours, and he decided this hours before we were ready to shoot. So uh, we were stuck. So the only thing we could do was uh, put cold contact lenses in his eyes. And uh, then he had problems with the wardrobe. He didn't like the wardrobe he was given. And the only thing on the truck that he would uh, wear was the coat. Um, and then we realized that he had an allergy to the lenses. And uh, so uh, couldn't have the lenses in uh, for long periods of time. And then, so you get the dark glasses. And uh, before you know it, uh, we've got uh, our Schwarzenegger. And obviously all of these things, uh, you don't get a chance to explain to people. And uh, so you end up, uh, uh, you end up in a situation, you know, you, 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 this is actually quite cathartic for me because I get a chance to sort of tell you what happened uh, as opposed to, I thought it'd be great if we had an Arnold Schwarzenegger looking master. <laughs> Whatever happened to those slime scenes that took place right in that hallway there? Um, yeah, cut for time, I'm afraid. Cut for time, here he is, a little close up. I have to tell you something though, he was really quite, quite great to work with. Uh, here's the 900 year diary. Um, we got the idea from, uh, you know, we, saw the, we always saw the, the stills of Patrick Trout of the 500 year diary and thought it would be fun to tack a couple of hundred years on. Um, oh, you've seen that one. This uh, uh, is backwards, but who cares? Uh, you, you get the same idea. 
Um, this was inspired, I, they wanted to do publicity shots for TV Guide and for all of the promotional material and, and asked me what kind of pose I would like to see the doctor in. And um, I just could never forget that wonderful photo of William Hartnell standing in front of the TARDIS uh, with the candle. And uh, it, it moved me then and uh, moves me now. And uh, we uh, chose to strike that pose. And uh, I'm just very, very proud of it. It's one of the, one of the most moving images, I think, of, of the Eighth Doctor. Here's Sylv, um, a real trooper. Uh, he was lying on his back for a week like that, owing and oaring and, and everything else. And uh, ultimately, the BBC cut most of his scenes for their airing, uh, which was very sad. Um, we were in the same hospital that the uh, X-Files used is quite a bit, that we scouted the location and then when we actually came back, X-Files had been in there and painted all the walls this really weird green color. And we didn't have time to change the paint, so we left it. Um, the hotel, uh, the hotel, the hospital that, that uh, we were in um, is, uh, is a, ho a hospital that is going to be torn down eventually. Um, the idea was, and it got pulled from the story because of time, but uh, uh, the idea was is that uh, she worked for a hospital that uh, had lost its funding. And uh, she was the only cardiologist left on staff. And of course, the idea was is when uh, she had a patient not only die on her but disappear, that that was one of the last drawers that they thought would ultimately close this hospital, therefore it had to be covered up, therefore uh, quite a part of the, hotel, of the hospital was sort of abandoned. But of course none of that got explained to anybody. Um, another neat thing about that, uh, that hospital is the actual hospital where we filmed it in, uh, because it was ready to be torn down, it had no heat. So in uh, January of, uh, in Vancouver, the, the temperature is just about like it is here. And uh, poor Sylvester was a very good sport about lying on the gurney for hours on end with bare feet and, and bare chest when we couldn't have him covered up. But uh, it, was, it was a kind of camping-like experience. It was sort of cool. This was the, uh, the, the, uh, the scene that got us into the most trouble. Uh, the, uh, the attack at the top of the show, which uh, was obviously, uh, some people felt was not Doctor Who, was extremely violent and other people didn't understand what it was all about. Um, we were asked to uh, create action at the top of the show. This is what Fox wanted to do. The storyline here, which got cut, was that uh, Yuji's, Yuji was an orphan, and uh, Cheng Li was an orphan, and his grandfather uh, owned a small shop, uh, which was supposed to be in this alley, uh, sort of a junk junk shop, kind of a hardware store, and uh, Yuji's character actually lived and slept in an old uh, abandoned water tower up on the top of the building, and uh, the father had been taking loans from a loan shark, and uh, the day that we meet Cheng Li, uh, he's actually being chased by the gang who was coming to collect the money from, from Granddad, who they'd already killed. Uh, none of that got explained, and you end up with a uh, barrage of bullets in, in an alley. But uh, I think when you go back and see the movie again, if you get a chance to do that, it'll make a little more sense to you. Um, a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, why he looks like Jesus Christ at the end of uh, Act One, the Who Am I? Um, it just happened that we had a shroud that he was supposed to pop out of a paper shroud, and he kept tearing. And uh, so we put him in the sheet. Uh, he was also freezing cold, he had nothing on under that. And uh, it was like 30 degrees below in, the, in there when we shot that. And uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the sort of the kneeling down bit, it just, it just ended up looking incredibly Christ-like. We didn't realize it until we shot it. But uh, there was no, there was no um, sort of predetermined decision to do that. This is the miniature, uh, which I was incredibly uh, uh, proud of. Uh, uh, a man who couldn't speak a word of English, brought his family over from Poland, built this by hand. 
Uh, I watched him do it over three weeks. The glass in the panels uh, is hand etched. He hand painted the panel on the left. It stands about three feet tall. It has 15 coats of paint on it. The light lights up. It's the most incredibly detailed model I've ever seen. Even the uh, down to the handle on the door, which he actually hand pulled from a piece of metal that he heated and, and carved while it was hot. It's amazing to watch. Um, and finally, I went up to him one day and said, "You know, what did you do before you came here?" He said, yeah, "I built a runway in Poland." He built the runway, oh, probably by hand, <laughs> but uh, I was just very impressed with the detail. Yes, I have it. <laughs> it's the only thing I do have. Um, this tragically has disappeared. Um, I had a very eager beaver for a prop department who had seen every episode of Doctor Who that had ever existed. And uh, for the first meeting came a clutched under their hand, the Doctor Who production uh, the manual, the, the Doctor Who manual. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Um, which actually shows all of the doctor's tools in it. And uh, he said, which of these tools should we have for the doctor? And I said, I don't know, you, you guys figure out what you want to do. I, I only know we, we're going to use the sonic screwdriver. And the guy goes, well, well, let me whip something up. <laughs> the guy went away and built every, every tool in that manual. And you can see them. Uh, you can see them if you look carefully in that doctor's bag. Every tool is there. The screwdriver, the, uh, the noggin nut, the neutralizer, or whatever, the ram neutralizer, and ev everything else is there in scale, fine detail. And uh, that has disappeared as well. Here's another look at it. Uh, here's a nice look at uh, one of the panels of the set. Um, Incredible detail, uh, seal of Rassilon for the handles, uh, struck from bronze, um, oak, oak panels. Behind this door was another, was, was the entrance to the TARDIS. There was a foyer. The foyer was built um, in the original design of the TARDIS room from, from, the, from, from the old series, the round element. Um, but for whatever reason, we couldn't light it. We didn't have enough light to light it properly, and so every time they were shot behind there, they just disappeared into shadow, and we didn't have time to relight it, so it never got seen. Um, so fun to throw those doors Here's away. a piece of it. You can see the round bells here. Um, just a detail of what we had done. There was a whole room like this that, look, that was uh, done to... Uh, sort of tie in the old, and uh, we never got a chance to use it. The detail is quite amazing. Here's a uh, sort of a lit version. The marble, the faux marble walls, the seal, the great seal of Rassilon, the antique Persian rugs, and um, the candelabra, and um, hundreds and hundreds of props, antique props that uh, we thought had gone from, you know, from his adventures. Uh, we, if you look around the set uh, in the movie, you notice very quick things uh, that uh, you know kiss the past um, uh, from various episodes. Um, too numerous to mention, but they're there. This was the music room, um, which was uh, something uh, that was inspired by uh, uh, William Hartnell's love of music and clocks was because my grandfather was a watchmaker and uh, he uh, synchronized watches for the old uh, Spitfire squadrons during World War II and collecting antique watches was one of his, uh, one of his pride and joys and uh, he was the one who I sat on his knee one night and watched the pilot episode of uh, Doctor Who. So this was really uh, a monument to him. That piano worked too. What? The piano worked too. Yeah, it did work. It was an old piano. Uh, here's a uh, here's a look from uh, uh, the library. Um, you can see the chair where Sylvester sat, looking back towards the music room. 
Here's another look at that. Some of these set pieces are dark, I apologize. Uh, here's the console. Uh, I think one of the things that is quite amazing is no matter how you shot this, when the set was lit, you really did get a feeling of infinite space. You didn't see the walls, you didn't feel the walls. And that was something that we were quite proud of. Uh, when the set was lit, it really was uh, a, a, a fun space to be in. You really did feel like you were in another world. Here's just some quick looks at the set. Here's the console again. Um, the television that you see, the monitor, we used an old TV from the 40s that we had wired up and, uh, uh, and they put it around this metal cage. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the guys, as a joke, put, put a chain on it, which is actually a toilet to chain from a, to, to flush toilets with. Um, but but uh, we just thought it was sort of more interesting to go with something like that, as opposed to trying to do a digital monitor or do, do other things that just, just make it feel sort of, you know, tired. Here's a really nice look at that that marquette or that sketch come coming to life. I think they really, I think they really kept true and did a really wonderful job. Have a look at the uh, console. Closer look at the uh, rotor. Uh, I think they did a nice job of uh, trying to pull in the time rotor and make that. Uh, originally, the uh, the concept was to put in a digital time rotor. Um, but we felt that uh, uh, by actually constructing a time rotor, um, it was uh, it would have been much much easier for us to uh, to work around. There's a scene. There's a scene in which uh, uh, a button, a switch is thrown, and, and uh, the, the universe appears above their heads. Um, had we have uh, gone the other way, we would not have been able to get that shot. Uh, wouldn't have been able to tie the two uh, physical effects together. So, here's another shot of the back of that of the set. Again, showing the pillars, which I think you know does a nice job of creating that feeling of of uh, continuous space. And uh, some of the wonderful uh, pieces of wardrobe that uh, dress the set. Um, in the uh, back in the shop, things were getting uh, ready for the cloister room. You can see the uh, the head of Rassilon, um, and these were uh, all uh, hand molded and uh, carved uh, by the uh, the guys. And uh, I think they did a wonderful job. Here's uh, you can see in the bottom of the frame uh, those incredible. Uh, torches uh, that uh, were all handmade uh, that uh, graced the walls of the cloister room. Uh, again, just to show you detail on the cloister room, uh, these are the handles to the doors to the entranceway to the cloister room. Uh, not a lot of this detail ultimately got seen, I'm afraid, but uh, every person who worked on this crew were diehard fans of Doctor Who. and. Uh, stayed beyond their allotted time to stay, even at night, to get things finished and, and done right. Um, everybody who had a job to do wanted it done right. And uh, it was quite a touching thing to see. So many people who worked so hard to sort of put their vision of Doctor Who on the screen. It wasn't just my vision, it was their vision as well. And uh, they did a wonderful job. This is the, uh, the Eye of Harmony which I know got me into a lot of trouble with a lot of fans. He said, there's only one Eye of Harmony, and it's on Gallifrey. How dare you make another one? And uh, we tried to explain to them that it's not actually uh, the Eye of Harmony, but in fact a portal to the Eye of Harmony, uh, which we didn't get a chance to explain. But what we thought was, in terms of creating logic for the tri time tra travel concept, as laid down by the numerous writers of Doctor Who, that there is a time stream in which the TARDIS exists and travels, and we thought it would be interesting to show how that time stream uh, uh, 
connects the TARDISes uh, to Gallifrey, uh, and, and that is sort of how, how the source of their power. But I'm afraid we didn't do as good a job of, of explaining that as we had liked. To show you one of the finished uh, heads on the banister. Can't see what that is, so we'll move on. Here's a scissor. Here's a, here's a wide shot of the cloister room. Um, I always loved the cloister room. I always thought that there was a wonderful idea to have this room, this sort of, this, the idea of seeing that rectory where, with all the ivy on the walls where, uh, you know, the bell rang when there, there was danger and it was sort of the heart and soul of the TARDIS and it was sort of a spiritual place. And uh, it always struck me as, as being a place that I thought would be sort of a sanctuary for the doctor. And uh, uh, so uh, I think we tried to, we tried to capture it in a, in a grander scale than, than before. And I think they did a very nice job. Glenn did a really cool job of lighting that place, too. Yeah, he did, didn't he? Uh, here's a production shot. Um, this was a very tough set to work in. Um, we had, uh, this was the day we had the one and only accident with Paul. Um, the uh, mechanical contraption that keeps his eyes open so that uh, the uh, life could be sucked out of him and poured back into the master. Um, we had him literally suspended on chains and uh, the smoke and the heat in there literally almost caused him to pass out. Um, he was uh, inc incredibly tough, but this was one of those moments where we just, you know, forgot about the actor and said, hey, we got a movie to make. And he was sort of hanging on a chain like a piece of meat, trying to get down, and uh, uh, yeah, that was very tough. All close the room. More detail. Here's uh, Eric as the master. Um, we thought it would be fun to, to, to try and uh, uh, show the Time Lord wardrobe that is, is sort of reminiscent to the Time Lord wardrobe that you saw in the original series, that wonderful high collar. Um, there was an incredible detail in this this uh, gown. He loved this costume. The suit under it um, is an exact replica of the suit that Roger Delgado wore as the master with the sort of uh, 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 Mao collared uh, jacket and pants. Uh, we got the information from the BBC wardrobe department. Sadly, we didn't get a chance to use it um, as much as we'd liked. Um, but I think what was so interesting to me about the shot is if you imagine him with a beard, uh, with a goatee, I should say, um, he he fit in pretty light nicely. Um, this was probably uh, the best time that he had uh, uh, during the whole shoot. Um, this is uh, uh, feel his three together. I, I thought Paul did a did a wonderful job. He was very natural uh, in the council room. Uh, first day of production, we had Sylvester in the council room. Um, Sylvester was actually the first person to see the council room finished. Paul wasn't ready to shoot until three days later. Um, we actually did Sylvester's scenes first. And um, none of us had really been on the finished set. That was the first morning that we were going to see it dressed and finished. They'd worked through the night. And uh, Sylvester was put into a uh, costume and uh, came out of his trailer. And we walked onto the set together. And um, it was really quite a wonderful moment. He looked around. He didn't say much. And uh, he sort of sat down in a couple of the chairs, touched the console. And then he turned to me and he said, uh, can I stay and play a while? <laughs> And uh, I was very touched by that. Um, he was um, sort of, you know, really thrilled to be there. But more importantly felt that, uh, you know, he saw in front of him an opportunity to reprise a role that he felt he'd never really gotten the chance to get into in a way that he had liked. Um, and, I, and I think he talks about that a little bit in the tape. Uh, he, did a, he did a sort of a memoirs tape. But um, it was really quite a wonderful moment. 
So um, the funny thing was, was that we were getting ready to shoot one of his scenes, and I think you saw, if anybody who saw the piece <coughs> yesterday saw the, the dailies, and uh, you know, the director said, well, just do what you do when you turn the console on, you know, how, how a doctor would, would make the TARDIS fly. And uh, Sylvester looked at him and said, I don't know how to fly a TARDIS. <laughs> Which, of course, knocked everybody on their backs because it's like, well, if you don't know, who the hell's going to fly this damn thing? <laughs> and uh, Paul was sort of hoping to say, okay, Sylvester, now how does all this work? <laughs> so, um, you know, that was quite a, quite a wonderful moment to see uh, two doctors who didn't know how any of it worked, which is sort of ironic because I don't think they really know how it all works anyway. Um, this was the, um, where is that Yeet? I can't see. He's gone to sleep. That's, I swear to God, he's gone to sleep down there. He, uh, he got in at 7.30 this morning. He was out all night partying and he's literally crashed out here in the front row. <laughs> you should. Um, Thanks. Yeah, this is the goodbye scene uh, where he's holding a bag which uh, had the uh, uh, it had sonic screwdriver in it, and, and uh, it poured torrential rain for a day and a half in Vancouver, and it did not stop raining here. Um, obviously, the film's not picking it up, but their hair was soaked, and every take we had to stop and dry them off. This was the night that E.G. fell in the pond. And I think that's it. Take the lights, we'll take some questions. <laughs> I was woken up now conveniently. Even, even in 
first round syndication, you look at shows like, uh, you know, Babylon 5 and, and even Hercules, you know, these shows are, are well over a million dollars an episode. Um, and so that kind of revenue uh, just doesn't, doesn't come from video sales. So unfortunately, that's not likely at all. Um, there is, you know, there are all kinds of ways in which we can generate revenue to produce a series. I don't think that's the issue. Finding the money to make Doctor Who is not, not a problem, to be honest with you. The problem with Doctor Who is convincing distributors and studios and networks that there is an audience for it. And they don't come to conventions and they don't really pay attention to the web. They just look at raw data. And unfortunately, um, you know, I don't have a lot to prove them wrong when, when we show them the kinds of numbers that we, we got for the, for the two-hour movie. Now, obviously, an argument can be made for why we got those numbers. We were on in, you know, in a sweeps period, which means, you know, every network brings out their big guns. You know, Roseanne, the big Roseanne episode in which her husband, you know, dies of a heart attack. And uh, I believe even here in Chicago, we had, uh, we had uh, basketball, which we were competing with. So it was a really rough night to be on, on television. You know, the problem is, is that, you know, they, they saw this big movie. Uh, we had wonderful press. The press were very friendly to us. And so all of a sudden, their egos run away with them. And they think they've got some giant hit. And, and instead of promoting it properly, um, it withers. And so that answers the question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I heard that John was at the uh, BAFTA screening in London. Unfortunately, I had a previous commitment. I couldn't be there. Um, I had a wonderful conversation with Philip Hinchcliffe, who um, called me and uh, thanked me and, and congratulated me and felt that uh, it was it was every bit of what it should have been. Um, I was very, very touched by that. And I also, um, just to share for the room, um, I, um, I did a convention in uh, Manchester called Monopticon um, prior to the, uh, the launch of, of the movie. And uh, Colin was there, John Pertwee was there, um, as were uh, as was several several other uh, several other uh, people from the show, including uh, 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 the Brigadier, and uh, and it was really wonderful to sit in a room with all of those people, and specifically John, who um, he and I sort of ended up becoming friends, um, albeit incredibly brief, and exchanged home phone numbers and, and addresses, and I got home. And there was a letter from him saying he was coming to New York. And if I was going to be in New York, he would love for him and his wife to have dinner with me and my wife. And we were going to be in New York. And uh, thought, yes, that, that sounds wonderful. And, um, and then plans changed and we weren't able to make it. We wrote him and told him that. And he wrote a, uh, a note back, which uh, we received, saying that uh, he was cutting his, his vacation short anyway and heading back. And we received that letter the, the morning he died. Um, so it was, that was very sad. But he, he saw the movie uh, before he died and, and uh, enjoyed it. So it was touching to, uh, to, to have known him as short as I did. But uh... I have a question. I saw something on the website that the BBC Cable was going to bring the show back in February. Have you heard any of this? I don't know what BBC Cable is. I don't know either. Um, I know they're, the BBC is constantly trying to expand, and, and one of the things they're working on right now is uh, uh, digital television. They cannot produce Doctor Who, period, unless BBC One takes it. That is part of their charter. They're a non-profit company. Uh, BBC Worldwide who distributes the show um, and is responsible for uh, the um, exploitation of all their ancillary properties um, is, is, is the funding organization. Uh, but BBC One has to take the show. If they don't take the show, BBC One can't produce it. Now, 
the only avenue that's left to us, if, they, if, if Michael Jackson, who is now the controller, continues to be uh, as much in disdain of the show as he appears, he literally thinks Doctor Who is a waste of time. Um, if that continues, the only avenue that is left open to us is motion pictures. Um, once Universal's rights expire sometime next year, that avenue can be explored. Um, and that's all I can really talk about right now. Yes, I must say I've just seen the slides that uh, my, uh, my belief now that the production design is in good hands, or hopefully will continue to be if anything else appears, has been uh, assured. Uh, I personally, you know, preferred the, uh, you know, the older style, you know, console room, and it's, you know, great to see it given a, you know, movie, I mean, theatrical, you know, quality and all that. And of course, what else other than a police box would look like a time machine anyway? But uh, I wanted to ask you this question yesterday at the uh, merchandising panel that you were to attend, which unfortunately was canceled. And uh, the reason I feel rather deeply about this is, well, I think it would be a little audacious of me to explain why here. But uh, as far as other visual icons of this series are concerned, their integrity, so to speak, you know, design-wise, are concerned. Uh, uh, the Cybermen in particular, in my case, and uh, the Daleks. Are any future designs, if they come to pass, and uh, uh, thoroughly scrutinized by Worldwide before they're approved? There's no one at Worldwide who even remembers the show. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's what's so funny about it. There is simply no one left who... Uh, it's just a lot of people who have archival material and a small amount of information about the show that they can only rely on people such as myself or John Nathan Turner or other people involved in the show. Um, I think one of the people they rely on very heavily now is Gary Russell uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of what, what gets written. Um, but in terms of uh, visual interpretation, there, there is literally no one there who, who, I mean, I dealt with people who literally were in their 20s. Uh, who didn't even know what Doctor Who was. When I was brought over for a press conference, I, the, I had a lovely girl uh, take me around uh, to all of the radio stations and TV stations for interviews, who in a cab readily admitted to me that uh, literally hours before she met me, she was handing a book on Doctor Who. To give you an idea of what's going on back there. Yeah. Yep. Now, personally, I think the Daleks should be re redesigned slightly. They should be given a more molded in appearance, and the establishment should be made once and for all that they get around on anti-grabs instead of casters. But uh, from some of the things I've read that you've said referring to the changes, the changes that might have been, or might ensue, uh, I think you yourself have said that the Daleks will always remain recognizably the Daleks, although the, their uh, tattiness with which some people recognize and uh, cherish, you know, should uh, probably be updated. Yeah. I mean, I think all things evolve. I mean, I think you can see evolution in Star Trek, uh, but I think uh, they obviously try to remain true to what, what feels like it, it keeps within the mythology of the show, and I think that's always important to do. So, I mean, whatever we did, I think we did it in the movie, you can see, is we try to at least remain true to the mythology of the show, and I think we continue to do that. Yeah, if the Star Trek... Uh, Let me take some other questions yeah. from some other people. Is there anybody else who... Yes? Okay. Or his name tag Sorry, Yiji. I just guess what uh, was your first experience with Doctor Who, or was this your first introduction to Doctor Who? Um, I'd seen a, a few of the episodes as a as a, as a kid. Uh, I watched a lot of TV when I was um, around nine or ten years old, and uh, so when Doctor Who was like I I, I didn't. Really 
really followed uh, any particular show, um, and 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 it wasn't a big fan of one particular show, but I did see a few episodes of Doctor Who, of Doctor Who, so I knew uh, I knew what it was before I did the show, and I did have some exposure to it. Yeah, this question's for EG too. Um, following your Bono impression from last night, I was just <laughs> I was just wondering, well, what sort of music do you like, and what are some of your other favorite groups? Um, I, I've been listening to U2 since I was about 11 years old, probably, and uh, they've always been one of my favorites. REM is another one that I like a lot. Um, right now, I uh, I listen to a lot of. Um, I guess you could sort of try to blanket statement call it techno, but I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of techno. There's kind of, there are ones on uh, on the radio you hear with the with the singers, you know, Oh Love Me Up Baby and, and stuff like that. And that's not really the brand of techno that I like. There's a lot of uh, really talented electronic musicians out there that not only create music but create sounds with which to create the music. And and they're they're sound technicians slash um, slash musicians, and and those are the kind of people that I look up to. And that's the kind of music that I, that I that I endeavor to make. I don't know if you noticed the background music for the uh, for the YouTube piece that I did yesterday. It was um, it was like an electronic version of it, and uh, it's 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 in a very rough stage right now. It's, but it's a, it's the only thing I had to to back me up on the YouTube thing. So um, <laughs> that's that's the kind of thing I'm working on. And mostly originals. That's the only cover that I've done. But uh, because I love that song so much, I I, I just did it. I had to almost. <laughs> Has the set for the, uh, the console room been saved, or are you going to have to redo that? Well, sadly, it's been destroyed. Um, every, everything from the uh, that's from the movie was destroyed, uh, except for the console itself, which we don't know where it is, uh, and some of the props, which were which were, which were stolen. Um, there was. Um, Paul McGann and his wife Annie walk into the club 
So, so here we are, um, and uh, my my girlfriend's brother is just like, ay ay. ay. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool, giving him that opportunity, and and, and Paul uh, Paul got a chance to party in Vancouver too. So, um, uh, with Eric Roberts, I spent a lot of time with him because a lot of my lines were, were with him, and um, I, I was I was not immune to the uh, to the reputation. You know the the rumors and stuff like that that I, I had heard. I was expecting him to be um, to be hard to get along with. And as soon as I, I, I got a chance to uh, to get to know him, I, I found totally the opposite. And um, uh, pretty much all I have to say about that is he's a really nice guy. And he taught me a lot of things. Um, whenever we were in a, in a scene together and uh, I was having trouble, you know, um, nailing something. Uh, he he was more than willing to step in and help me out with that, and I, I totally appreciated that. And with Jeffrey Sachs' input as well, um, oh, it was cool. Eric is one of those very interesting actors. He's, he he has a totally different persona when he's in front of a camera than he does off camera. He it's really he's a really odd bird in that way. You know, um, it's hard to explain. And it's very disarming uh, to uh, to be with actors who are like that. They uh, they have a way of, uh, of turning into somebody they're not. Uh, very interesting. Any questions? Almost we have to call time on the session. We have oh, to wait okay. a little bit.